Hi, this is Margarita Cardenas once again with Urban Traditions for a new season. And uh, today we're honoring the rose and for a different twist, a native born rose. Now, um, you may ask, why native? What, what is that? Well, to tell you the story, um, when everything began, the world actually began, um, it was a total witch's brew here, gases forming all over, nothing we know now could live or breathe, and um, at four, four to five million years later, photosynthesis was born, where um, the plants that were natively born in any geographical location um, first got insects that could pollinate and other pests that would, con that would be the pest controllers. That is why when any native plant is transported to a different location or it does not survive, uh, you have to fool it, uh, their habitat, so that it will survive. Uh, since it is February, and we are honoring the rose, Valentine's is just around the corner, uh, we went looking for uh, rose growers in the Bay Area, and to my surprise, there was none, uh, totally none. Um, but we were very lucky to find a spectacular nursery that is in uh, Woodside, and they specialize in native-born plants. We have the proprietor here, Kathy Crane. Hi, Kathy, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you, uh, Kathy. Now, um, I just spoke a little bit about how the native plants were born. Can you, can you add anything to it? Well, I think uh, we should look at California native plants because we are local in California and the plants that we grow at our nursery are all plants selected from the region, pretty much starting at the Mexican border, going up into Oregon and then possibly a little into Washington, but plants that are used to the climate of California. They're used to a dry, dry, dry summer and usually a wet winter. They're used to certain kind of soil conditions. Um, amounts of sun according to whether they're closer to the coast or up in the mountains. And those plants are well suited to be used in our landscaping needs and also um, in just for enjoyment and pleasure. Exactly, and I was just amazed at your property. It was like going into a magical forest really, because little deer, wildlife all over the place. It was just amazing. Um, I felt transported. Tell us a little bit about the property and, and the yeah. county there. Um, one of the special things about Yerba Buena Nursery is that we grow native plants in a place where native plants naturally grow themselves. So, for instance, when you drove down our road from Skyline Boulevard and you took the two-mile private road to the nursery, you were driving past trees, shrubs, plants that would have grown there for many years that we actually then grow in our nursery and that people can see growing on the road and then come to the nursery, purchase and take home and put in their own gardens. So the setting is really important um, in that it gives you a sense of what these plants look like in the wild and how they grow in combination together. And that's, that's what you will see when you come to Yerba Buena Nursery. Yes, um, th that lovely creek. Uh, tell us a little bit about the history of that creek. Can you tell us? Anymore? Yeah, what I can tell you is that on, on the property where the nursery is located, we actually have springs. Now a spring um, is unique in that instead of a well where you have to pump water out that w is, is way below the surface. These springs come horizontally out of the side of the hill right on the nursery property. And the water is just fresh, pure, and it is the water source, the only water source that we have on the property. The springs then feed into the creeks, and the creeks are used by the visiting wildlife. We have, at the moment, 
six wild turkeys that live full time on the property. Oh wow! Lots and lots of deer, um, quail, raccoons, bobcat, mountain lion. These are all creatures that we see regularly who live on that property. All of whom need water, and they they regularly go to the creek to to draw water. Oh my God! Mm -hmm. So um, even mountain lions. I have down. seen I've seen the mountain lion only once. It's it's kind of rare to see it, but yes, mountain lions live in in the area, and as they should, that's their habitat. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, you are, tell us about why yerba buena. Yerba buena, in my experience, is the peppermint herb, and um, but when you showed me mm -hmm. the uh, the little your namesake. The little um, the plant your, the plant the yerba buena. Um, explain to us the difference between the two. Sure, um, yerba buena is means good herb, and the yerba buena plant is a very small leafed trailing plant. It grows along the ground, and it was originally the name of San Francisco before San Francisco was named after Saint Francis. It was called yerba buena. And the plant yerba buena grew in San Francisco. And there's also a yerba buena island in the bay. And yerba buena, the plant grew there as well. Now I think you would be hard pressed to find any yerba buena left growing in the town of yerba buena because it's all been paved and built and so on. But originally that plant would have grown there. And it is in fact a trailing mint. Unlike the kind of mint that spreads invasively. This is a very delicate plant that would grow in shady areas and it would not at all be invasive or take over, but it would be lovely to use as a tea or uh, it was used as a medicine by some people, I think for stomach aches even. Exactly. And so, but the yerba buena that you had there, that's not for tea or you can also? Yes, you can make ah. a tea either from the fresh or the dried leaves, and there are companies that actually make a yerba buena tea that you can, well, they don't make the tea, they gather the leaves and, and then they put them for you to, to buy and make tea. Right. Mm -hmm. So now, how, what is the process of how, because you have such a large property and the botanical garden, and uh, what is the process of your plants um, to get to the customer's hands? Well, we do most of our propagating right there on the property. We do it the old fashioned way. It's kind of one plant at a time. And depending on the plant, we have several processes we use. We either collect seed, or gather seed from other sources. We take cuttings from the ends of certain plants and we root those cuttings. And in some cases we divide plants, say for instance, iris. Some iris are done from seed and others we take the whole iris and we divide it into sections, get those sections to root, and then we start new plants. So the three methods we use for propagating are again, seed collecting, cuttings, or divisions of the plants. And we do that there at our potting tables and in our old fashioned greenhouses. Yes, I saw that. Um, uh, they were hard at work that day. <laughs> Yes, I saw that you have such lovely greenhouses, and um, but they were not enclosed. What, what, yes. Yeah, what well, you know, if you grow a plant in a climate-controlled area with a particular temperature and a certain amount of light that you um, produce, when you take that plant out of that building and you put it in your garden, it's going to be in shock. But our greenhouses, on the other hand, are very natural. They have no sides. They have a small roof to protect them from hail or snow. But there's no climate control. So our plants are grown in very tough conditions, in very natural conditions. And when you take those plants that have been grown in such conditions out of the greenhouses and put them in your garden, they are really tough and ready to go. So what is the difference between your nursery and these franchise nurseries that we usually go to? Well, I, I can't compare Yerba Buena really to any other nursery because there truly is no other place like it really even in the state. Um, we grow our own plants 
most nurseries have their plants delivered from a grower. So there would be a major difference. We only do native California plants. Most large nurseries would have a variety of plants, most of which are not native. So when you go to a, a franchise nursery, you're likely to find very beautiful hothouse grown flowering plants from other countries. And that's, that's a gross generalization, but it, it's at the same time very true. So this is why I did not find any roses. So where do they originally come from during this time? Well, I, I believe, and again, I grow native roses at my nursery, but most roses, like the kind that I get for Valentine's Day that arrive from the florist, um, they come from other countries or they come from hothouse grown situations. This is not the time of year to even grow roses in your garden here in Northern California. Most roses would be cut back this time of year and, and would not be producing flowers. So now let's, let's talk about our little um, superstar this month, mm -hmm. the rose. And um, you have, uh, it's called the Rose Californica? Rosa Californica. Rosa Californica. It's the wild California rose. Ah, okay. And um, uh, so right now, um, we did not find any flowering ones. They're still growing, mm -hmm. and, uh, but we have pictures to show everybody. Uh, and uh, um, you do have them already in pots, though. We do have them in pots. And actually, as I was driving here today, I noticed along the sides of many roads that the rose hips were still present on the wild rose bushes. So this time of year, although there are no flowers on the roses, the hips, which are the large red seed pods, are on the rose bushes, and they are providing food for wildlife even in the winter. So um, uh, insects and so they, they feed off the rose. Well, of actually, California. not the insects, but um, birds would eat these rose hips and possibly small mammals as well. So it's not only insects that benefit from um, native plants. It's also the wildlife, the birds. Oh, the birds, the butterflies, the hummingbirds, all the things that people really treasure in your garden that are alive. They need a food source. They need a water source. They need a, a housing source. And native plants provide food and shelter for many, many wildlife forms. Interesting. Yeah, this is interesting and very essential that uh, we've had a show before also on the bees. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, the guest that was here also was very uh, championing the native plants because of the uh, it provided food for food stores for the bees. Mm -hmm. So this is the same reason also that you have. The right, and it, it is very important if you are looking to sustain wildlife like bees who are important pollinators, to be sure that there are no chemicals used with plants. And to that end, with native plants, we do not use chemicals such as anything that ends in the word "ide," pesticide, herbicide, fungicide, insecticide, those would all kill insects, even the beneficial ones. So we stay away from chemicals and poisons and native plants typically don't need them. Oh, oh okay. so that's your, your plants then are more hardy? Well, they're hardy, but they also don't need chemicals in order to sustain themselves. If they do have a spot on the leaf, why that's natural um, and it's to be expected. And that leaf will eventually replace itself with a nice fresh leaf. So why spray it with something in the meantime? Exactly. Well, I saw that at your, um, you have a storefront mm -hmm. and um, that you sell curios and, and explain to us about Yeah, because Yerba Buena is, is located on an old cattle ranch uh -huh. in an area of San Mateo County that used to have a lot of large pieces of land and farms, we maintain the atmosphere of, of an old ranch, of an old farm, which, which was the property before it was a nursery. So it was the Eisenberg Ranch, and we have a lot of the artifacts Oh. from the ranch, they're displayed, and also a lot of farm-type artifacts and historical things for sale. 
Oh, okay. Yes, I saw that you have seeds and, and books, actually, the books. Right. It's hard to go to a place that just has books about native plants or just has native seeds, but that's what we offer is if someone is interested in learning more and would like a book on native plants, we've got the very best ones available there. And um, tell us also about the different events you have because you make it, a, I think, a customer's um, uh, you give the customer a little event there, a special, uh, specializing in just making them home, homey. Uh, we do. Well, there is a, there's a farmhouse on the property that dates to 1905. There aren't that many farmhouses left, I would suspect, in San Mateo County that are over 100 years old, but we have one of them, and we have an old barn. And in the farmhouse, we often have uh, talks on different native plant subjects, and occasionally we offer a tea, and then people can come and tour our botanical garden and sign up for a tea and have sort of a destination place to spend a day with native plants and uh, just get to enjoy themselves a little bit. Yes, I've, well, I did. Uh, just going down the road, just getting there was a totally, uh, just a heavenly experience. So now, here we are once again, for our uh, UT walking segment. We went to Half Moon Bay and with Marlene. And uh, let's go to our tape and see what she has to say. Um, what flowers, um, plants would grow good in the area of fog and wind and coldness that will bloom and be a pretty flower, not just a green plant? So Kathy, for Marlene, what mm -hmm. would you say, what uh, flowers year-round, depending on the weather, and you know it's always cold and clammy mm -hmm. and windy, especially in the Half Moon Bay area. Right. So what flowers um, well, year-round? I would recommend for the, for the coastal areas some of the wild lilacs and the sea, they're called ceanothus. They do extremely well near the coast. They flower in a bright blue color. They're very good for butterflies, bees, and um, they do well in the soil with a kind of wind and less than full sun, but exposed areas that you'd expect on the coast. Oh, fabulous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's great. We have one more. Um, his name is Newell. Let's go see what Newell has to say for us. The tomatoes. Yeah, the fat boys and the little cherry tomato plants. Yeah. And you're having problems with them? Uh, a little bit because of the lack of sunlight, I think, out here in Half Moon Bay, during the summer anyway. Yeah. Uh, should be uh, a little better, though, in the next couple months. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. And so we have an expert on the studio. What would your question be for our expert? Um, let's see. I'm getting a little... Uh, uh, black spots on the leaf so I need to know what what eliminates the little black spots on the on the green leaf itself okay. the, the, the fruit is fine but uh, I think it would help if I could eliminate that so Kathy Newell has tomatoes um, he's uh, I'm surprised the tomatoes do well in Half Moon Bay I thought they needed more Sun but his little uh, leaves had little black spots on them mm -hmm. and what Oh, I know that's a bad word, insecticide mm -hmm. to you. I know that's what he wants, but what can we tell Newell? Well, since a tomato isn't a native plant, I wouldn't be an expert on that, but what I would say is that to stay away from any chemicals that he could because it would certainly affect other things in his garden and to look for some kind of a solution that was more organic. That's what I would suggest to him, and possibly to consider having some plants in his garden that would bring beneficial insects into his garden, which could help anything that he grows. Thank you once again for joining us, and thank you to Kathy Crane. She has really opened up my eyes uh, to champion uh, propagating native plants in my garden. You all must go and experience that transcendental meditation into her magical forest called the Yerba Buena Nursery. There's so many activities. Check them out on their website, yerbabuenanursery.com. 
And uh, thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you for having me. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to get those Cosmos anymore. I'm getting the... Native California bunch grass. Bunch grass to attract those pollinators and keep those pesty controllers out of my garden. All right, make friends with us on Facebook. I need, we need those questions. Thank you and happy gardening everybody.